And welcome to Storytime with Captain Party. Uh, last episode, we were reading Chapter 5, and we learned about monkeys and chestnuts and self-confidence. And today we're going to learn some more stuff in Chapter 6. Alright, uh, the next time I go visiting my mom, I'm still Fred Hastings, poor old public defender, and she keeps me yakking all afternoon until I tell her I'm still not married, and then she says, oh, that's a shame, and then she turns on the television, some soap opera, you know, real people, pretending to be fake people with made-up problems, being watched by real people to forget their real problems. The next visit, I'm still Fred, but I'm married with three children. That's much better, but three children? Three is too many. People should stop at two, she says. And the next visit, I have two. And every visit, there's less and less of her under the blanket. And in another way, there's less and less of Victor Mancini sitting in the chair next to her in the bed. And the next day, I'm myself again, and it's only a few minutes before my mom rings for the nurse to escort me back to the lobby and we sit, not talking, until I pick up my coat and then she says, Victor, she says, I need to tell you something. And she's rolling a ball of lint between her fingers, rolling it smaller and tighter. And when she finally looks up at me, she says, Fred Hastings was here. You remember Fred, don't you? Oh yeah, I remember. These days, he has a wife and two perfect children and it was such a pleasure, my mom says, to see life work out for such a good person. I told him to buy land. My mom says, they're not making it anymore. And I ask her who she means by they, and she presses the nurse button again. On my way out, I find Dr. Marshall waiting in the hallway. She's standing just outside my mom's door, leafing through notes on her clipboard. She looks up at me, her eyes beady behind her thick glasses. Her one hand is clicking and unclicking a ballpoint pen fast. Mr. Mancini, she says, and she folds her glasses and puts them in her chest pocket of her lab coat and says, it's important that we discuss your mother's case. The stomach tube. You asked about other options, she says. And from the nurse's station down the hallway, three staffers watch us, their heads tilted together. One named Diana calls, do I need a chaperone for you too? And Dr. Marshall says, Mind your own business, please. And to me, she whispers, these small operations, the staff asks as if they're still in high school. Dina, I've had. See also Claire, RN. See also Pearl, CNA. The magic of sex is it's an acquisition without the burden of possessions. No matter how many women you take home, there's never a storage problem. To Dr. Marshall, her ears and nervous hands, I say, I don't want her force-fed. The nurses are still watching. Dr. Marshall cups a hand behind my arm and walks me farther away from them, saying, I've been talking to your mother, and she's quite a woman. Her political actions, all her demonstrations, you must love her very much. And I say, well, I wouldn't go as far as that. And we stop. And Dr. Marshall whispers something, so I have to step closer to here. Too close and the nurses are still watching and breathing against my chest, she says. What if we could completely restore your mother's mind? And clicking and unclicking her pen, she says, what if we could make her the intelligent and strong, vibrant woman that she used to be? Sure. My mother, the way she used to be. It may be possible, says Dr. Marshall. And not thinking about how it sounds, I say, God forbid! And then real fast I say, oh, well, that's probably not such a great idea. And down the hall the nurses are laughing, their hands cupped over their mouths. And from even that far away you can hear D Dinah say, well, it would serve him right. And on my next visit, I'm still Fred Hastings, and my kids both get straight A's in school. And that week, Mr. Hastings is painting our dining room green. Blue is better, my mom says. <coughs> Thank you.
for a room you're going to put any sort of food in. And after that, the dining room is blue. And we live on East Pine Street, and we're Catholics, and we save our money at the City First Federal, and we drive a Chrysler. These are all my mom's suggestions. The next week, I start writing things down, the details, so I won't forget who I'm supposed to be from week to week to the next. The Hastings always drive to Robinson Lake for our vacation. I write, we fish for steelhead. We want the Packers to win. We never eat oysters. We are buying land. Each Saturday, I first sit in the day room and study my notes while the nurse goes to see if my mom is awake. And whenever I step into her room, I introduce myself as Fred Hastings. And she points to the remote control to turn the television off. Boxwoods around the house are fine, she tells me, but privets would be better, and I write that down. The best kind of people drink scotch, she says. Clean your gutters in October, and then again in November, she says. Wrap your car's air, air filter in toilet paper for longer service life. Prune evergreens only after the first frost, and ash makes the best firewood. I write it all down. I inventory what's left of her. The spots and the wrinkles, her swollen or empty skin, and flakes and rashes, and I write reminders to myself. Every day wear sunblock cover your gray. Don't go insane. Eat less fats and sugars. Do more sit-ups. Don't start forgetting stuff. Trim the hair in your ears. Take calcium. Moisturize every day. Breathe time. And make it stay in one place forever. Do not get old. And she says, Do you hear anything from my son, Victor? Do you remember him? And I stop. And I feel my heartache. But I've forgotten what feeling means. Victor, my mom says, never comes to visit me, and if he does, he never listens. Victor's busy and distracted, and he doesn't care. He's dropped out of medical school, and he's making a big mess out of his life. She picks up the lint on her blanket. He's got some minimum wage kind of job as a tour guide or something, she says, and she sighs. <sighs> and her terrible yellow hands find the remote control. I ask, wasn't Victor looking after her? And didn't he have a right to live his own life? And I say, maybe Victor's so busy because he's out every night, literally killing himself to pay her bills for constant care. That's three grand each month just to break even. And maybe that's why Victor left school, I say, just for sake of argument, that maybe Victor's doing his fucking best. I say, it could be that Victor does more than anybody gives him credit for. And my mom smiles and says, Oh, Fred, you're still the defender of the hopelessly guilty. My mom turns on the television, and a beautiful woman in a glittering evening dress hits another beautiful woman over the head with a bottle. The bottle doesn't even mess her hair, but it gives her amnesia. Maybe Victor's struggling with problems of his own, I say. The one beautiful woman reprograms the amnesia woman into thinking she's a killer robot that must do the beautiful woman's bidding. The killer robot accepts her new identity so easy that you have to wonder if she's just faking the amnesia and was always looking for a good reason to just go on a killing spree. Me talking to my mom, my anger and resentment just sort of piddles out as we sit and we watch. My mother used to serve eggs scrambled with dark flakes of non-stick coating from the frying pan. She cooked with aluminum pots, and we drank lemonade out of spun aluminum cups while we chewed on the soft, cold lips. We used